Good morning, church. Thank you for coming this morning and listening to this uh, video. Um, I know that it's still COVID times for most people, and we want to thank God that we are able to give you these live streams and be able to share his word in this wonderful way. Uh, Reverend Makoti is not there this week, so I will be leading the service. He's gone to presbytery, and we pray that whilst in presbytery, they are able to make great decisions for the church. Let us pray. Lord, we come before you this morning, your people. After a week of living life and doing things the way we do in a very busy world, sometimes so lonely, Lord, we come before you and we ask you to be with us this morning as we share your word, as we hear from the nuggets of your holy word that you have given to us as food, nutrition for our diet, for our spirits to be able to live on a daily basis. Lord Jesus Christ, we realize that we are not perfect and we do sin. We make mistakes. We say things that we're not meant to say. We go places we're not meant to go. We drink and we touch and we look with our eyes, do things that we're not meant to do. And so, Father, we ask you to forgive us. You who is so good to us, you who is so faithful, you who is so willing, we know you have already forgiven us. You say none, none, none who have come to you and cried and you were unable to help them. So, Father, we come to you, your humble servants, asking for you to forgive us when we have wronged, when we have gone astray like sheep from the shepherd. But Father, as we come to you this morning, we also have a heart of thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for this week. Thank you that we are still alive. Thank you for our health. Thank you for our families. Thank you for this church. Thank you for everything that you have given to us. And most of all, thank you for Jesus, your son, who came and died on the cross for us. Thank you for that. We are so grateful for Jesus. And so, Father, as we go into your word this morning, we want to worship you in spirit and in truth, a forgiven people, a much-loved people, a people that you sacrifice for. Father, receive our worship, receive our praise, receive our prayers this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask Ben to come forward and read the word of God this morning. And I'll come back and share a little bit of what God has laid on my heart. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you again. Great to have Bridget with us preaching the word. It's quite exciting. Uh, today I'll be reading from Matthew 25, 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed, clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothing or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, 
you did not do for me, then they will go to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Wow, what a solid bit of scripture. Can't wait to hear what Bridget's got to say. So we'll get Bridget back and hear the word for this week. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Ben. It's such solid scripture indeed. It is so powerful indeed. Stories are very powerful. Jesus could have just said, help your brother and sister when they are in need. If you don't, you have no part in the kingdom. But a story draws us. It makes us feel, it makes us learn, it makes us understand what information is being passed to us. Charles Dickens grew up in the 1800s. His father mismanaged the finances and ended up um, bankrupt in the hands of the debtors. Ten years old, Charles had to work and help support his family. He experienced a lot of poverty and injustice. And I think that's not new for many of the children that we have seen in Africa where some parents had buses and they had fleets of buses but they mismanaged it and children had to go through a lot of poverty and had to struggle to get where they were. He knew firsthand what being exploited and powerful was. Charles took all these painful experiences and hard times and used them as the content for his stories. If ever you've read any of Charles Dickens' stories, and I hope some of you have, um, you will be sure to have experienced some of the most powerful um, um, analogies that he brings out. They are great teachings. You would call it a parable in a way, because stories that awaken the conscience of the British Empire and the industrialized action, stories that help change the world, are some of Charles Dickens' stories. A Christmas Carol is one such story. Dickens brings to life the infamously stingy uh, Ebenezer Scrooge. Dickens' character description of Scrooge is so powerful that the name itself synonymously with, is, is, stands with greed, self-serving, and caring person. If you say to someone, stop being a Scrooge, they know what you mean. The unmistakable message Dickens is trying to get across to his audience is that he, we have no more responsibility to care for our fellow men. That love and benevolence can change lives. It can change lives. The person who practices giving and sharing with others, Scourge, of course, by the end of the tale is transformed. While he doesn't quote scripture, Charles definitely illustrates through the ghost of Jacob Marley that there are some who will go to eternal punishment for being greedy, self-serving, and caring people. I looked at the parable Ben just read to us, and as I was reading from the word, I thought for the past three weeks, Reverend Johnson has shared with us really what we can call and how to prepare for the end. I remember two weeks ago I came up and I read, and I read from the gospel, and it was about the ten virgins, five wise, five not wise. And I've, we've also listened to the other parables that he has taught. Last week, unfortunately, I got sick in church, and I had to leave during the service, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But this week, as I share with you, I look at the parable which comes in the 25th chapter of Matthew. And the scholars clarify that this passage is a parable, but I, when I look at it, I think it's actually telling us what is to come, and that's prophecy. Observe in verse 1, it says, At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like, Jesus clearly communicates that he's using imagine, imagery as a means of teaching. He's using pictures. He's using a, a scenario for us to imagine it and to see it. So as he uses that imagery, he sits, he explains how this will happen. He doesn't use imagery until he gets to the part where he's looking at separating the sheep and the goats. There is only imagery in the passage. It's 
used to illustrate the action of separation so that people can visualize the scene. You've seen separating done before. I'm sure you've separated. I remember in Africa when we were young, we used to separate the rice when we've been to the field and we sit down and would separate the rice, so you know, when it's been grained out. You would separate the rice and you'd find two separate things. And you've all separated something before. And the shepherd separating the sheep from the goat was something common and in these days. You see, not uh, the picture of sh sheep and goats, looking at that picture on the screen, you, you can see that they look pretty similar. If you look at um, the one who is in the brown in the bigger picture, you can see that that's a goat because of his horns. But he's amongst the sheep. And if you put his head down, he looks like sheep if you look at them. I know these are sheep in different countries, goats in different countries, and therefore the pictures can be different for what you, you can imagine a goat to look like or a sheep to look like. But I, in these times, sheep and goats in Palestine were looked after together. Why does a shepherd separate his sheep? First of all, I want us to be very clear. The shepherd in our instance is our God, Jesus Christ. And when we talk about sheep and goats, I know many, many preachers have preached this before. And some will use the analogy of saying, um, the sheep are those who are saved and the goats are those who are not saved. But I beg to bring in a very different look at this. I believe the sheep and goats are both in the church. I believe the sheep and goats are all in the building. And that's why I'm gonna show you the differences between sheep and goat. What's different is our shepherd, the good Lord, Jesus Christ. He is the good shepherd and he looks after his sheep. We become part of God's family. We become the sheep. Why does the shepherd separate the sheep? When we, he looks at us, he can see the differences in our characteristics. Let's look at the actual animals themselves. Sheep are gentle, quiet, and easily led animals. Goats, on the other hand, are pushy, self-serving, and headstrong. One saying, I feed the, sheep, the hungry, and the other says, whatever. Within the church, within the building, within those who have been saved by the blood of Jesus, you will find people who will say, I feed the hungry, and people who say, whatever. Why does the shepherd separate the sheep from the goats? Most goats are naturally horned, but many sheep breeds are pulled and naturally hornless. Those goats' horns can be used to bring harm to another goat and even to a person. So therefore, when you look at it, you have to think, what am I doing? Am I being a sheep or a goat? Why does a shepherd separate the sheep and the goats? Goats are naturally quarrelsome. And I think I put two goats there hitting heads. They love, they're short tempered, they're rare and but in but order to establish dominion. Rather than being passive animals like sheep, they are more aggressive in tendencies. This is quite confronting for us. When I say the sheep and the goats are within the church building, it's quite confronting. Because you then realize that we are supposed to be a family. We are supposed to be loving. We are supposed to be caring. And yet, I bring this analogy that at the end, he will separate the sheep and the goat. I remember scripture that comes to mind that says, um, when the weeds and the, 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 when the sower was sowing, and, and, and Jesus said, let them grow. It will be seen at the end. At the end, we can separate them. It is a similar analogy. What does a sh why would a shepherd separate the sheep from the goats? Goats do not require as much supervision. And they care as care as sheep. Perhaps this is because they are more independent animals. They, they love to adventure. They love to move around. They love to run around. They, you know, and sheep, unlike goats, you know, move in a community. They love to be part of their community. 
Goat given the opportunity would go back into the wild. Goats given the opportunity would redo what they, you know, would try and breach the fence as that goat is doing. They don't like the rules. They don't like the church structure. They don't like to be under governance. They want to breach the fence. Why does a shepherd separate the sheep from the goats? Goats do not graze like sheep. They are browsers. They nibble here and there, sampling variety, bushes and leaves, because they are browsers. But sheep graze. Sheep are a steadfast people. Sheep are calm. Sheep, who, they are called lone mowers sometimes. They, they, they are founded. And yet, goats will graze up and down everywhere. It, they will pick them, and it's everywhere. Why does a shepherd separate the goats from the sheep? Goats are also, they like high places, often heading upwards. They are headed as well as sheep, together with sheep, because they would rather lead than follow. Typically in Palestine, as I said earlier, they would be mingled together in the day, but at night they would be separated, as you can see in that picture. So the analogy Jesus uses was not an analogy that was foreign, it was contextual. It was something everyone in that day would have understood when he says the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Why does the shepherd separate the sheep from the goats? Why did Matthew use images of sheep for the righteous and goats for evil? Ancient people drew morals, analogies from their habits of sheep and goats from what I have displayed. Sheep were intelligent. Yet quiet animals, submissive persist and persistent. Male sheep fearlessly protected their young and their females whenever they were in danger. They surrounded their young and their females. There were characteristics from sheep that they admired and they saw and therefore was used a lot in the scriptures. Why does the shepherd separate? the sheep from the goat, in a culture that encourages loud debate and social one-upmanship. Contemporaries of Jesus admired in sheep were loyalty, silence, strength. Goats, however, were stubborn, destructive animals. If left unattended, male goats would not protect their mates. And if anything, this is where the analogy I would think comes from, whereby someone who has been unfaithful to the wife can be called a goat in our society. Why does a shepherd separate the sheep from the goats? In the Greek culture, there were, the goat symbolizes loose morals. There are some words I've written up there that are in Greek. The Jew hated symbols of the goat, for it represented disobedience and disciplined life. So that's the bit about the cultural background about the sheep and the goats in imagery. But the action of separation itself is not imagery. It's an actual event. The sheep are the people of God. We are the sheep. And amongst us, some of us may display the behaviors of the goats. That's why, at the end, the master will separate us. People who are part of a family, and because they are family, they inherit the kingdom. How do you know you, they are family? Well, like sheep, they care for the flock. They care for one another. When did you last visit the sick? When did you last phone a, a, a lonely brother in these COVID times? When did you last visit the prison or the aged? Sheep care for their flock. Brothers and sisters, there's been times when I have been um, outside. I remember we used to do the paper run in Mariba. We once lived in Mariba and we used to do the paper run with the children. 
And I remember one day going um, very tired after doing the paper run and we parked outside KFC and there was a lady out there. It was a cold morning and for Mariba it doesn't really get cold. But it was cold because we were also wearing our jumpers. And this lady had no cardigan, nothing, and she was set outside KFC. And I remember walking past her thinking she's a drug addict. She's a, you know, how people these days will stand outside a shop and ask you for a dollar or two dollars. And I thought, oh, let me quickly go in. But as I passed her, part of me said, offer her something. Offer her food. I was going to buy, you know, the cheap $9.95 bucket of KFC. And we normally would buy about three because my boys were, would be quite hungry at that time after a, a, a paper run. And I remember going in and then coming back out to ask her, would you like something to eat? And she said, yes, please, sister. She even called me sister. And I went in, I bought her something to eat. But still, my heart was not settled. I'd given her food, but it was cold, as I said. And I remember I, I wanted to take off my jumper, but it was one of my, you know, my little labels. I didn't want to give this one away. And I thought, oh, this isn't good. But I, I have more than a, a hundred jumpers in the house. And I thought, oh, this isn't a good test for me. And so as I came back out, I gave her the food and she was so great. Oh, thank you, sister. And she's walking me to my car. And I'm like, don't come to my car. I don't want you to know my car. And as she, as she stood there, I then said, uh, uh, would you like my jumper out of nowhere? Uh, you seem a bit cold. And she went, no, 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 no. My, my, my boyfriend's just going to get me one. And so I didn't have to give away the jumper, but I at least got to the point where I could have offered the jumper. Last week, I got sick in church. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't breathe, and I, it scared me. It scared the life out of me. And I... I, I, I lifted my hand and one of my children in the back managed to come forward and, and, and take me out. Simba, he's only nine years old. And as Simba took me out, um, I, I think not many members noticed. I was in hospital um, undergoing various tests whilst everyone was in the service. But little Simba served me. We, he took me to the hospital. We drove, I think, at about 10 k's an hour because I was in pain. I couldn't breathe. I had so much pain in, and I, I didn't know what was happening. And it was cardiac. So I, it frightened me. So when was the last time you rang someone to say, how are you? Because you never know. I may look fit and well, but I'm not well. We are in various sicknesses and prisons in our head and which you can't tell if you look at the outside. I remember when we were in England, there was a girl called Yvonne Hassel and we worked together. When I first migrated to England, as most of you would know, I, I didn't go there as a nurse. I trained in England, but I didn't go there as a nurse. I went there as a teacher. And so when I got there and I lived in England, I worked at a hospital as a cleaner. And whilst I was cleaning, I remember this lady, Yvonne, uh, what became a friend to me. And she was a secretary to one of the very big, big cardiologists in that hospital. And Yvonne became friendly and we became friends. And when my husband eventually was able to migrate to come and be with me with the children, I remember I couldn't afford to, to pay what was required. Yvonne helped us. Yvonne did not earn much. Now that I look back, her salary was not more than what I earn now. Probably my salary now is double what Yvonne earned. But Yvonne sacrificed to pay a tenth of her pay towards Johnson's fees. When I was preparing this sermon, it touched my heart. And I thought, how did she do it when I can't pay $10 for another World Vision project that I have seen on TV. And this is where the word says, when I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, and we shall all be surprised and say, when, Lord, did this happen? How did it happen? But the truth is, it's in our courtyards on a daily basis. A, a gentleman, Judge uh, Raymond Zondo, that's the picture up there, he is a judge in South Africa. If you Google his name, you can see he is a fantastic judge. 
One thing about this man is he gives his testimony. And he says, I became a lawyer via it whilst I was very poor. And he saw he didn't want to go into drugs, he didn't want to go into gang, whatever. He didn't want to commit crime to get his education. And his mother was sick, he said. And so she couldn't fend for the family, and he was the oldest. So he made a decision. He went to the local Muslim shop, and he said to the shopkeeper, the owner, could you provide my mother groceries each month? And I, in turn, will work for you on the holidays. And when I finish and I qualify, I will personally pay it back. But because I want to get an education, because I want to be successful and I can do this, please help me. And this man helped him. He said he went to university, he studied, he paid his full bills and gave his mother groceries and throughout his education. And he said, when I qualified, I went to the man because we signed a contract, he said. So I went to the man and said, look at my certificate, I have qualified. And I would like to, I, I'm now going to start paying you back. I've got a job. And the man said to him, I do not want a penny from what you did. Pay it forward. Judge Zondo up to today has got a, a program that he runs in South Africa that is called Paid Forward, that he, he, he educates other children who are from a poverty-stricken background because it happened to him. We can make a difference with the little we have. We can do something for someone with the little we have. Whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers, that you do unto me. God so loved everyone, everybody in the world, the little baby, the stranger in the street, you and me. God so loved us that he actually died for everybody. Those who have been saved, those who have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, are part of the family. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become children of God. Even to them who believe in his name, I've put my faith and I've put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who loves me and gave himself for me. If you have done the same, then you, my brothers, are my brothers and sisters. We have accepted and have been adopted into the family of God. We are sons and daughters. We are the heiresses of the kingdom. Jesus said in Matthew 12:50. For whoever does the will of my father is my brother and sister. So you see, my analogy is not so far. When I say, because he says, whatsoever you did to the least of my brothers, that you did unto me. My brothers and sisters, he says, whosoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister. At Christmas, we give various gifts. In my house, there's about nine of us. And we give gifts, we buy beautiful gifts for one another. We don't buy 10 gifts, but we buy one gift per child. And each child, everyone picks a name and we buy a gift. And we do this every year, religiously. Not because of anything, but because we love our family. We want to share. We want to give them what the best of everything. Why? Because we love them. We show them the love. We give generously. We even give beyond measure because they are part of our family. We do that in a way of showing love to our families. Jesus is showing us here that he wants us to love each other in that manner. To provide and be a blessing to one another in this church family. Before we can go outside, Charity begins at home. Before we can even stretch to the streets and the, and the outside borders, we begin in our church house. What are we doing for the brother next to you and the sister across and the brother you haven't seen for weeks? Like sheep, we stick together, we protect each other. That is how God wants his church family to look like. 
if you are believing in Jesus, if you are part of the family. So what are you saying, Mrs. Makoto? What are you saying, Bridget? And what is Jesus saying? Is it we help out only fellow Christians? Then we have got it all wrong. It's wrong if we think we only help fellow Christians. What I'm saying is, if you are part of the family, you will want to care for the family. The work is not what saves you. The going to visit the sick, the phoning, the giving, the, the serving is not what saves you. We are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, by the blood. But the works are evidence of salvation. They prove to the world that we are saved because our works, our fruit follow us. It's what the sheep do. The goats, on the other hand, they assume they are the flock. They assume they are going to be in the kingdom. Look at verse 41 to 45. Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I, look how many of us have bought houses. And I've got three, four bedrooms that are empty. And it's for my son, and it's for my daughter. How many of us have actually accommodated a stranger in our homes? Hey, it's not easy. This is real. We become selfish when God has blessed us. We look at ourselves and our family and we put all the restrictions that we can put. And yet God is saying, I was a stranger needing clothes. I was sick. I was in prison. He will reply and tell the truth. Whatever you do to the least of my brothers, that you do unto me. Everyone thinks they are getting into the kingdom. All of us in this church, we think we will get into the kingdom. But Jesus clearly shows us that some people are completely unaware of the fact that they are lacking. In conclusion, church, everyone under the sound of my voice, listen, at this moment, God has given us heed. He's given us the opportunity. He's reminding us. He's nudging us on. He's waking us up. He's saying, don't be caught unaware as who he says is. That could have been the worst fate of all. Look at Dickinson's story. Scrooge heeded the warnings of the three ghosts of Christmas and changed his ways. It wasn't too late for him, but he dared not wait. You have time to repent of your sin and confess to the Lord Jesus Christ you, your need for his salvation. Once you've done that, so that you can be filled by the Holy Spirit, he will prompt you, he will impress upon you, he will tell you, he will change you, he will teach you, he will guide you. He is a good God. Once you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he will change the way you look at things. These things become natural. They become part of your life. Last week when I got sick, somehow, somewhere, I don't know how much Simmons found out that I was sick. You know, by Monday, she had baked little muffins that she brought to the house. When I was discharged from hospital, because I actually spent the night in hospital, by the way, and I had to go through this all these scans and everything, uh, Marge had delivered something already. Whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers, that you do unto me. Brothers and sisters, it will be sad if I preach such a sermon talking about the end time and the separations, the goats and the sheep, and did not allow someone out there to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you don't know the Lord, and you are saying, look, I don't know whether I may go to a ship and things are confused in my life. I want to give you an, ex an opportunity now. I want to pray with you. I want you to do the sinner's prayer. 
The sinner's prayer is how we become family. It's how we become part of this kingdom that we are talking about. You may be just listening to this and you just trembled upon it and you thought, oh, let me just listen to, to what Bridget has to say. Well, it's your day. It's your day. If you want to put your life right with Christ, I'm happy to pray with you right now, here and now. I'm going to pray with you. If anyone wants to receive Jesus, lift your hand up. He will say to the sheep on the right, come, and the goats to the left. Lift your left hand up, your right hand up, and pray with me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I've gone astray. I've not done things the way I should have done them. I've done certain things that I'm not proud of. I want you to forgive me. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I receive you, Jesus, today to change me to make me, to break me, to mold me. I want to be called a Christian. I want to be in that number. Or when the saints go marching in. Lord, Father, God, my friend, help me to live life the way you want me to live. Amen. And so if you've prayed that prayer, it's not enough. You need to find someone, find a Christian brother, find a Christian church, find someone, tell them what you've done and ask them to help guide you. Find a Bible-believing church. Find a church which will teach you the truth of this gospel, will help you to grow. For the wait is not so, it's not gonna be so soon. I know a lot of people say, it's nearly there, the signs are there. I say, well, quite a different story. It could be a long wait. And therefore, we need to be prepared. We need to put our houses right. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.